All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here is the list of topics to be covered in this video. Problem one, we have six graphs and we're asked which of the following represent y as a function of x and of the ones which do, which are one to one. Now to be a function, an x value must correspond to at most one y value. So a vertical line x equals constant must intersect the graph at most once. And we call this the vertical line test. So turning our attention to the graph in the upper left, we're going to swipe a vertical line across the graph and ask, does it ever intersect the graph more than once? As we move that line left to right, we only see one intersection at a time, so it's a function. Next, still only one intersection at a time, it's a function. Next, still only one intersection at a time, so it's a function. Now in the bottom left, one intersection at a time, still a function. Next up, aha, here's a vertical line that intersects the graph more than once, so it's not a function. And finally, we also see vertical lines can intersect this graph more than once, so this one is not a function either. Now of those which are functions, to be one to one, y values should correspond to at most one x value. So we take horizontal lines and scan them across the graph and ask, does it intersect at most once? And we only have to do this for the ones which are known to be functions. So starting in the upper left again, we're going to move a horizontal line from bottom to top and ask, does it ever intersect the graph more than once? No, this horizontal line seems to only ever intersect once at a time, so it's one to one. This one, however, aha, I can draw a horizontal line and get multiple intersections, so it is not one to one. And this one also can get multiple intersections, not one to one. And in the bottom left, horizontal lines intersect at most once. This is a one to one function. We do not need to check the other two because they weren't even functions to begin with. In problem two, we're going to evaluate each of these three expressions exactly. Now the arc cosine of C equals theta by definition means that theta is the unique angle between zero and pi whose cosine is C. In other words, pointing somewhere on the unit circle whose X coordinate is C. So looking at item A, we're looking for an angle from zero to pi whose cosine is minus one. Let's draw our standard unit circle here. And if we want the cosine to be minus one, we want the X coordinate to be minus one. So what angle between zero and pi points somewhere on the unit circle whose x coordinate is minus one. It's this angle here, that's pi. For item B, we want an angle between zero and pi whose cosine is minus root two over two. So here is the line x equals minus root two over two and observe that it intersects the circle twice, but we're looking for an angle between zero and pi pointing somewhere on the circle with this x coordinate. We're looking for this angle here. Referring to a standard reference circle, this is three pi over four. For part c, what's an angle from 0 to pi whose cosine is minus root 3 over 2? Again, we're looking for an x coordinate of minus root 3 over 2. There are two intersections with the circle, but only one of them corresponds to an angle between 0 and pi. And again, referring to a standard reference circle, the angle that points to minus root 3 over 2 is 5 pi over 6. In problem three, we're going to evaluate the following expressions exactly. Now the arctangent of m equals theta by definition means that theta is the unique angle between minus pi over two and positive pi over two whose tangent is m. In other words, the ratio of y over x in the point on the unit circle that theta is pointing towards is equal to m or y is equal to m times x. So in item a, we're looking for an angle between plus or minus pi over two whose tangent is root three over three Here's our standard unit circle. Here's the line y equals root three over three times x. It intersects the circle twice, but only once for an angle between plus or minus pi over two. It's that angle there. Referring to a standard reference circle and seeing what this angle is, whose tangent is root three over three, it's the angle pi over three. In part B, we're looking for an angle between plus or minus pi over two, whose tangent is one. In other words, y equals one times x. Again, this intersects the circle twice, but only once with an angle between plus or minus pi over two. And that angle on a standard reference, you can look it up, is pi over four. And in part C, we're looking for the angle between plus or minus pi over two, whose tangent is minus root three over three. Here's the line y equals minus root three over three x. The only angle between plus or minus pi over two 
this one here, looking at a standard reference, this is minus pi over 3. In problem 4, we're going to evaluate these three expressions exactly. Now the arc sine of c equals theta, by definition, is that theta is the unique angle between plus or minus pi over 2, whose sine is c. In other words, an angle pointing somewhere whose y coordinate is c on the unit circle. So in item a, we're looking for an angle from minus pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, whose sine is 1. Referring to our standard unit circle, we want a y coordinate of 1. Here is the unique angle between plus or minus pi over 2 that points there. That's exactly pi over 2. For item B, we're looking for an angle whose sine is 0. In other words, the y coordinate is 0. Here's the unique angle between plus or minus pi over 2. That's the angle of 0. And for part C, we're looking for the unique angle between plus or minus pi over 2, whose sine is root 3 over 2. In other words, the y coordinate is root 3 over 2. Here is the angle between plus or minus pi over 2 that intersects that line. And looking at a standard reference circle, we would see that this is the angle pi over 3. Problem 5, use a calculator to evaluate arctangent of negative 3.7, round to three decimal places, give the answer in degrees. There's really nothing to do here but use your calculator or computer or whatever. Just make sure you're in degrees mode because we were told to give an answer in degrees. If you're not, convert the answer to degrees mode after you get it in radians. You'll end up with negative 74.876 degrees. We can check if this is a reasonable answer. Here's our standard unit circle. We're looking for an angle whose tangent is negative 3.7. In other words, y should equal negative 3.7 times x. What's the angle between plus or minus pi over 2 that this line gives? It's this angle here. Is that negative 74.876 degrees? Yeah, it's plausible. I believe it. I mean, I certainly couldn't tell the decimal approximations, but we're definitely looking for something negative and, you know, sort of closer to 90 degrees than, than it is to zero, I guess. Problem six, we'll find the measure of the angle theta. We'll give the answer exactly, but also round it to two decimal places. Now looking at the triangle, we can see we have an angle theta across from it, side length four, adjacent to it, side length 10 in a right triangle. So the tangent of theta is four tenths or two fifths. Theta is in a right triangle. So it's between zero and pi over two, which means it's definitely between plus or minus pi over two. It's an angle, it's between plus or minus pi over 2, it's tangent is 2 fifths. By definition, this means it is the arc tangent of 2 fifths. Now, any of our reference triangles will not have a tangent of 2 fifths, so we can't really give a better answer than this. This is our exact solution. The arc tangent of 2 fifths, whatever that is, is exactly the angle theta. But if you plug this into a calculator, round it off to two decimal points, either 0.38 radians or 21.80 degrees. In problem 7, let's evaluate exactly the arc sine of the sine of pi over 10. So if we were to set the arc sine of y equals theta, we're saying theta is the angle between plus or minus pi over 2 whose sine is y. So in our problem, if we set our answer equal to theta, we want an angle between plus or minus pi over 2, and we want the sine of our angle to be the sine of pi over 10. So what's an angle? between plus or minus pi over 2, so that the sine of that angle is the same as the sine of pi over 10, we could just take pi over 10. That's an angle, it's between plus or minus pi over 2, and its sine is definitely the same as the sine of pi over 10. Problem 8, let's evaluate exactly the arc sine of the sine of negative 11 pi over 2. Now, if we were to set the arc sine of y equal to theta, by definition, we're saying theta is an angle, it's between plus or minus pi over 2, and its sine is y. So in our problem, we're looking for an angle between plus or minus pi over 2 whose sine is equal to the sine of 11 pi over 2. We cannot just let our answer be negative 11 pi over 2 because that's not in between plus or minus pi over 2. However, what is the sine of negative 11 pi over 2? It's exactly 1. So what's an angle between plus or minus pi over 2 whose sine is 1 pi over 2? In problem 9, evaluate exactly the arc cosine of the sine of pi over 4. If we were to set the arc cosine of something equal to theta, theta is an angle between 0 and pi whose cosine is x. So we want the arc cosine of the sine of pi over 4 to be our answer theta. We want an angle between 0 and pi, and the cosine of our angle is equal to the sine of pi over 4, which is root 2 over 2. What's an angle between 0 and pi whose cosine is root 2 over 2? Pi over 4. 
Problem 10, evaluate exactly the arc sine of the cosine of 7 pi over 6. If we were to set the arc sine of y equal to theta, this is simply saying theta is an angle between plus or minus pi over 2 whose sine is y. So in our problem, we have the arc cosine of cosine 7 pi over 6 is going to be our answer theta. So our answer theta is an angle, it's between plus or minus pi over 2, and its sine should be whatever the cosine of 7 pi over 6 is. The cosine of 7 pi over 6 is minus root 3 over 2. So what's an angle between plus or minus pi over 2, and the sine of that angle is minus root 3 over 2? This can be found on a standard reference. Just look in quadrant 1 and 4 between plus or minus pi over 2, and look for an angle whose sine is minus root 3 over 2, and it will be exactly minus pi over 3. In problem 11, evaluate exactly the sine of the arctangent of one-third. Compared to the previous several problems, we do not have here an inverse trig function of a trig function. Rather, we have a trig function of an inverse trig function. So arctan of one-third inside the sine function, arctan of one-third by definition is an angle between plus or minus pi over two and its tangent is one-third. If the angle is in quadrant one or four, but its tangent is positive, then the angle is in quadrant one. So the arc tangent of one third is in quadrant one and it points to the point three comma one so that its tangent would be y over x or one third. So here we have the angle in quadrant one and it is the arc tangent of one third. We can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the distance of this point to the origin. It's three units horizontal and one unit up which gives it a distance from the origin of root 10. So now we have a point root 10 away that this angle is pointing towards, and we're asking what is the sine of this angle? Well, the sine of theta is just computed as opposite over hypotenuse or one over root 10. In problem 12, let's simplify the expression tangent of arc cosine of a over 10. Arc cosine of a over 10, by definition, is an angle between zero and pi, and its cosine is a over 10. Now, we do not know if a is positive or negative. So we don't know whether this is in quadrant one or two, but we can solve this problem without relying on a picture, which is an important skill to develop. Pictures are great, but in mathematics, I think it's rather important to move beyond them and not be trapped by your own visual intuition, but develop the algebraic skills to solve problems even without it. So let arc cosine of a over 10 be theta. Theta is an angle, it's in quadrant one or two, and it points somewhere on the unit circle where the x coordinate is a over 10. But the unit circle satisfies x squared plus y squared equals one. We set x equal to a over 10, which allows us to solve for y to be plus or minus the square root of 100 minus a squared over 10. We know, however, we're in quadrant one or two. We don't know which one, but it doesn't really matter whether a is positive or negative we are in quadrant one or two, the y coordinate is positive. So we solved for y is plus or minus some expression, it's got to be the positive one. So y is equal to the square root of 100 minus a squared over 10. Tangent of theta is y over x. We know y is the square root of 100 minus a squared over 10, and we know x is a over 10. So take the ratio, the tens cancel out, and you get the square root of 100 minus a squared over a. In problem 13, we will simplify the expression sine of arctangent of t over 3. Arctan t over 3 is an angle in quadrant 1 or 4, and its tangent is t over 3. So whatever theta is, the arctangent of t over 3, it points to a point with coordinates 3 comma t, so that y over x, its tangent, is t over 3. The distance to the origin of this point by the Pythagorean theorem would be the square root of 3 squared plus t squared. So t, the y coordinate, is r times the sine of theta, which means sine of theta is t over r, and we just solved for r. So the sine of the arc tangent of t over 3 is t divided by r, and r is the square root of 9 plus t squared. In problem 14, we will simplify the expression secant of arc sine of a. If we were to let theta represent arc sine of a, what this means is that theta is an angle, it's either in quadrant one or quadrant four, it's between plus or minus pi over two, but its sine is a. So if that angle were to point somewhere on the unit circle, the y coordinate is a, which we can then solve for x. On the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals one, we have set y equal to a, so x is plus or minus the square root of one minus a squared. 
Now, I don't know exactly where this angle is, but it's either in quadrant one or four. But either way, the x coordinate is not negative. So between x being plus or minus the square root of one minus a squared, if x can't be negative, x is the square root of one minus a squared. Secant of theta is simply one over the x coordinate, and we just solved for x, so here we have it. The secant of the arc sine of a is one over the square root of one minus a squared. In problem 15, a mass is attached to a spring. It's pulled away from equilibrium by 16.3 centimeters and released. Once released, the mass's motion as it bounces back and forth is given by x equals 16.3 times the cosine of 4.46t. x is given in centimeters. t is presumably given in seconds. How long after the mass is released will it be 5.87 centimeters away from equilibrium for the first time? So we're setting the distance away from equilibrium, 5.87 centimeters, equal to what we were given as the expression that represents this distance, 16.3 times the cosine of 4.46t. We can divide both sides by 16.3. And now, the first time the cosine takes a particular value will be somewhere between 0 and pi. Cosine starts at its maximum and between zero and pi goes all the way to its minimum. So the first time it takes a particular value is definitely between zero and pi. So an arc cosine is appropriate because arc cosine will produce an angle between zero and pi. So taking an arc cosine of both sides, the arc cosine of 5.87 over 16.3 is equal to 4.46 times t. We can divide both sides by 4.46 and we're done. If you want, plug it into a calculator. T is approximately 0.26959, etc. seconds. And looking at our options, that's definitely C. Problem 16. Outside temperature over the course of a day may be modeled as a sinusoidal function. Suppose you know the temperature varies between 64 and 96 degrees during the day. Presumably those are your minimum and maximum. And the average daily temperature first occurs at 9 a.m. How many hours after midnight to two decimal places does the temperature first reach 72 degrees? Now the average of the maximum and minimum will give us our median. The average of 64 and 96 is 80. The distance from the median to either max or min will give us our amplitude, that's 16. The period is presumably 24 hours. That allows us to solve for omega to be pi over 12. So at time t equals nine, we're at our median and presumably increasing. Okay, so the average daily temperature first happens at 9 a.m. And after 9 a.m., the sun is out, we should be heating up. So starting at our median and going up is a positive sign shape, but we're starting at 9 a.m. We've shifted nine units to the right. So here we have a function. It's a positive sign. Its amplitude is 16. The period is 24. It's shifted nine units right, and the median is 80. Now let's set t equal to 72. We are looking for when is the temperature first 72, so set the temperature to be 72. We can subtract 80 from both sides and divide by 16. Now we're trying to solve for t and it's buried inside a sine function. If we take an arc sine of both sides, this will produce an answer between plus or minus pi over two. We need to consider if that will certainly be what we're looking for the first time we reach 72 degrees, or might we be solving for a time we reach 72 degrees, but not the first time? So we have solved that the temperature obeys a certain sinusoidal function, and setting temperature equal to 72, we have negative one half is the sine of pi over 12 times t minus nine. If we take the arc sine of both sides, we have forced this resulting quantity to be between plus or minus pi over two. So the resulting quantity of pi over 12 times the quantity t minus nine is between plus or minus pi over two. Multiplying by 12 over pi and adding nine, whatever t we solve here is between three and 15. So using the arc sine function as we did, we'll force a solution somewhere between three and 15 hours after midnight. What if there was a solution between zero and three hours after midnight? Arc sine is not quite going to give it to us. So let's solve for t. We end up with the arc sine of minus one half is exactly minus pi over six. This allows us to solve that t is exactly equal to seven. So of the times between three and 15, the unique time at which we will have temperature 72 is at seven. 
So we have determined that at 7 a.m. the temperature reaches 72 degrees, but we used arcsine to get there, and arcsine tells us this is the only solution, and for this particular problem we solve that that is the only solution between 3 a.m. and hour 15, or 3 p.m. Is there another solution between 0 midnight and 3, 3 a.m.? Because the problem asks us, what is the first time after midnight that this temperature is reached? We found 7 a.m., but that says it's the only time from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. Was there another solution between midnight and 3 a.m.? Now, the restricted domain of arcsine goes from its minimum to its maximum. So in our problem, T equals 3 is our minimum. It is one quadrant, or 6 hours, before the median temperature, which happens at 9 a.m. 6 hours before 9 a.m., 3 a.m. There's our minimum. The maximum, by the way, occurs 6 hours after the median, or at 15, 3 p.m. So between the minimum and the maximum, 3 a.m. to 3 p.m., when does it reach 72 degrees? 7 a.m. But what about between midnight and 3 a.m.? Well, sinusoidal curves have a great deal of symmetry. Our target temperature was reached at 7 a.m. That's four hours after the minimum of 3 a.m. So if our target temperature is reached four hours after the minimum, it was prior reached four hours before the minimum. The minimum was at 3 a.m. Four hours before that would be negative one, one hour before midnight. So that is not the solution we're after. So 7 a.m. is in fact the first time after midnight at which the temperature is 72 degrees.